of my head will not be visible. Uh. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, sorry for the delay a bit. Uh, we are going to begin our session, inshallah, the seventh session on uh, ventilation strategy in pediatrics given by Associate Professor Dr. Ismail. Uh, let's begin with uh, uh, Surat al -Fatiha. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. So, uh, today we'll start talking about ventilator strategy for the common uh, diseases in pediatrics. So, already we, we completed the introduction, uh, which uh, was about the basics and the pulmonary mechanics, and generally about the initial seating and about the weaning. So now we will apply on certain conditions. I will start talking about if we have restricted disease generally without specification, or if we have obstructive disease. Because these are the two main categories for respiratory diseases, either restrictive or obstructive. Generally, when I have restrictive disease, means I have low compliance. Low compliance. So I need to open the lung. I need to open the lung. So I need high beam. I need high beam. So if I have restrictive disease, I need high Plus low tidal volume, low tidal volume. This policy for restrictive disease, we call it the protective. Strategy. Love protected strategy. Okay, let's describe it. Why they call it lung protected? Because we know the problem of mechanical ventilation is that lung injury. When we use mechanical ventilation, one of the complications is that lung injury. So they found that when you use high tidal volume, you may cause that lung injury. Because that will cause inflammation, will cause inflammation and the release of pro-inflammatory markers, which can lead to tidal, which can lead to lung injury. So that's why they found it is good when you open the beep. When you use the beep, so you keep the lung open. And as we know, last time, beep improves functional residual capacity. It keeps open. It keeps the airways open and the alveoli open. And it is not injurious to the lung. It is not injured, but it is continuous pressure. The injury to the lung happen when we have something on and out, in and out. Like remember, when we talk about HFOV, HFOV is not dangerous because we are using main air wave pressure. Yeah, remember? When I use the balloon, yeah, this balloon. So if I keep giving high tidal volume or high pressure on off, like Injured to the lung, but if I keep continuous pressure in the safe zone, like so, this is good for the lung. This is lung protective. So, this is what we use we use high beam and low tidal volume. When you hear the term high beam, yeah, we need to know what is high beam. What is high beam? So, for beam, we have no. We have low, medium, and high. Low, medium, and high. Low beam is 4 to 5 ml BKG. Low 
low B, it's four to five centimeters. Any question? Four to five centimeters water. That's low B. Medium B is five to eight centimeter water. High beam is 9 to 12 centimeter water. And we can go up to 15 if ARBS. In case of ARBS, we can go up to 15. This is beam, big and expiratory pressure. So this is the beam. When I say high beam, I mean from 9 to 12 centimeter water. When I say low tidal volume, <clears throat> low tidal volume means it is around four to six mm British. That is low tidal volume. That is low tidal volume. Yeah. We know the tidal volume range in children, it can go up to 10 mL per kg. So when I say low tidal volume, I am in this range, not more than 6 mL per kg. So that is the policy in the restrictive disease. When we come to obstructive disease, it is different. Here, <clears throat> there is debate about B. When we, when we come to the conditions later, we will tell. Yeah. But generally, we don't use high B here. Why? Because if we have obstructive disease, means <clears throat> We have air throbbing already. We have air throbbing, like we have bronchial asthma, especially in the chronic condition. So the child will have air throbbing. So already have O2 beep. Already have O2 beep. So here, the policy or the strategy is different. In obstructive disease, it is not high beep. In obstructive disease, we need high TE. High. TE, high TE. How to get high TE and I, why I need high TE? Because we have prolonged time constant. Do you remember the definition, time constant? If you go to the previous uh, sessions, previous lectures, we mentioned about time constant. Time required to equalize pressure between the proximal airways and distant airways and alveoli. So, in obstructive disease, this time constant is prolonged because we have a lot of air, we want to take it out. So I need to give time. I need to give high TE to allow that air to go out. So how to get high TE? To get high TE, I must have low rate. I must have low rate. Yeah, without low rate, I cannot get high TE. As you make the rate more, you will get less TE. You will get less TE. So keep lowering. So this is the policy in obstructive disease in general. So now let's go to the conditions one by one. <clears throat> so remember, this is the basis of the strategy: restrictive high beam, low tidal volume, obstructive high TE, lowering. <clears throat> So let's start with RBS, respiratory distress syndrome, which is common. RDS, respiratory distress syndrome. So respiratory distress syndrome now is the most common indication for admission to an ICU. Yeah. With development of neonatal care, now RDS is the most common indication for admission to an ICU. <clears throat> Before we talk about RDS and what is the strategy, let's understand the battle of physiology. Let's understand the battle of physiology. So after that, we decide whether it is restrictive or obstructive and how to go in that strategy. Let's talk about development the lung. Because we know RDS is common in premature babies common in premature babies. And as the baby is premature, so his lung is not fully developed. For development of the lung, 
we have four stages. We have pseudo glandular. Pseudo glandular. We have canalicular. We have secular. And we have the last stage is alveolar. These are the four stages. <clears throat> so, so the glandular from six to 16 weeks. From six to sixteen weeks. So you will not see, you will not see babies with pseudo glandular. You will not see baby sixteen weeks in uh, labor room or in unit living. Can I you not sixteen to twenty six weeks? So this one you may see because you may take care of twenty six weeks newborn or twenty five or twenty four. So you may see some babies with canalicular. So the lung is not well developed. It's not for fit for gas exchange. Because for gas exchange, we need alveolar. Here in canalicular, we have, what the changes we have? We have branching, continued branching, continued branching of airways. Continued branching. And we have thinning. We have thinning of the airways. So continued branching, and we have thinning, thinning of epithelium. So there is some gas exchange. There is not complete, not good, not satisfactory gas exchange, but there is some gas exchange. There is some gas exchange because the epithelium becomes thin so there is some gas exchange when we have canalicular so easy to remember 6 to 16 16 to 26 26 to 36 this is stage we call it secular means there are secules secules are like this secules these are secules. So secules like they are ductus with brominance, like alveolar brominance. So they can make gas exchange, better gas exchange than an alveolar stage. Then alveolar is the last stage, which is from 36 weeks, 36 weeks until two years. So we have to know that. Until two years, the lung is still developing. The lung is still, still developing. So alveolar, when you have the nice alveoli. Yeah, you have that nice alveoli. This is alveolar stage. And here you have the perfect gas exchange. <clears throat> so this is the development of the lung. Then we have the transition. So the transition, we have transition of the lung, transition from fluid filled. So the lung in the fetus is a fluid filled. When the baby comes out, it becomes air filled. So from fluid filled, it becomes air filled. So we have development and the transition. And we have to remember that during this period, the development and transition. If we have asphyxia, if asphyxia happen, it will cause worse, worse damage. And worse ARDS, worse ARDS. So baby shouldn't come out already. And can a stage or secular stage, baby should come out. Once baby come out, the damage will be there. Baby comes out, and alveolar cells will be damaged. Definitely, they need to stay in uterus. But when you have asphyxia, the damage is worse. 
the damage is worse and so the uh, ARDS, the, the RDS, sorry, it is not ARDS. Yeah, I have to correct that. It is wrong. When you say ARDS, it is wrong. It is only RDS. It is only RDS. ARDS is for older children. How? The neonatal period. Yeah. In the neonatal period, it is RDS. It is not ARDS. <clears throat> So let's talk about mechanics and premature babies. Mechanics, pulmonary mechanics, pulmonary, pulmonary <coughs> mechanics, and preterm babies. Preterm babies. <coughs> So the most important that they have low surfactant, low surfactant, low surfactant. So we remember when we talk about the pulmonary mechanics, when we have low surfactant, so there's tendency of collapse because there is surface tension. There is tendency to collapse, which is high elastance, high. Elastas, which means low compliance, low compliance, low compliance. Yeah, because you have high elastance, so this will make the distensibility is less difficult to distend the lung of premature baby. So what will happen to that time constant here? There will be short time constant. Short time constant. Short time. So opposite of obstructive disease. They will have short time constant. <clears throat> so again, time constant. Remember, it is the time required to equalize the pressure between the proximal airways and distal airways. So here, because low compliance cannot distend too much, so the time constant is short. Okay, let's go to their airways. The airways, airways are small. Airways are small. They have small airways. So what will happen to the resistance? So small airways will lead to high resistance. High resistance because diameter is very important factor for resistance remember in the previous classes when we mentioned the Boisel's law Boisel's law we said the resistance equal a eta a eta l over pi r to the power four so radius is the most important. When we have low no small radius, we have high resistance. <clears throat> what else premature babies have? Their chest wall is not ossified. Chest wall, chest wall is not ossified. Chest wall is not ossified and has low muscle mass. Low muscle mass. So this one will lead to high compliance of the chest wall. High compliance. High compliance. So opposite of the lung. You see the lung has low compliance, but the chest wall has high compliance because it is not ossified. Still, they have the cartilage. Still, they have the cartilage in the ribs. Not well ossified like adults. <clears throat> okay. 
So what is the half? Premature babies, the half intrapulmonary shunt. The half intrapulmonary shunt. And the half dead space, higher dead space. High alveolar dead space. High alveolar dead space. Dead space. Why they have intrapulmonary shunt? So remember when we talk about uh, the basics, the shunt means when you have normal flow, but you have low oxygen coming from the alveoli. And we mentioned the development they have, pseudoglandular, <clears throat> canalicular, secular alveolar. So they have no enough alveoli. They don't have the alveolar stage. So they don't have enough surface area, no enough surface area. No enough surface area. No enough surface. They don't have. Don't have this well developed alveolus. So this means they have intrapulmonary shock. They have intrapulmonary shock. They have alveolar dead space. They have why alveolar dead space? They found that the alveoli in premature babies. When you see that. Pulmonary capillaries, there is high distance. This is alveolus and this is pulmonary capillary. They found here high distance. High distance. So this high distance is considered dead space. This high distance is considered dead space. <clears throat> Remember also, when we mentioned about dead space, we said there is anatomical and alveolar in the previous classes. And they have also higher anatomical head space because they have higher head size. Small babies, relatively, the ratio of the head to the lung is higher. So that's why they have higher head space in the lung, which put the pharynx and the upper airway. All that is head space. Then if we talk about surfactant availability, surfactant availability, most of the premature babies, they have some surfactant factor. They have some surfactant. Because we know surfactant is produced by type 2 pneumocyte. Surfactant is produced by type 2 pneumocytes. At what gestational age? 22. You see, easy to remember. Type 2 at 22 weeks. So always do two. Type 2 pneumocytes at 22 weeks. So most of premature babies, they have some surfactant. They have some surfactant. But the problem, like I said, when they come out, they shouldn't come out. The lung needs to stay in utero. When they come out, there is alveolar damage. This alveolar damage will lead to leak. Protein leak from alveolar cells. Protein leak. When there is protein leak from alveolar cells, this protein leak inhibit, inhibit surfactant function. So even this some surfactant which is there, it will be inhibited. It will be inhibited because of the protein leak. So that's why we need exogenous surfactant. We need oxygenous surfactant. This small amount of surfactant will be inhibited by the protein leak. If there is no oxygen surfactant, once you inhibit the surfactant, it will not work. Then we'll go to hypoxia. They will go to hypoxia and acidosis. When they go to hypoxia and acidosis, hypoxia and acidosis themselves, they are inhibitory factors for surfactant production. They are inhibitory factors for surfactant production. Sure. Actually, if you have a small baby who needs surfactant and you don't give him surfactant, yeah, you are mishandling. You are mishandling. You need to give that exogenous surfactant. So RDS, respiratory distress syndrome, has another name. Has another name. The other name is HMD, hyaline membrane disease. 
hyaline membrane disease. Why they call it hyaline membrane disease? Because there is hyaline membrane. So the name tells us there is hyaline membrane. The alveolar are lined with hyaline membrane. What are the components of hyaline membrane? Three and three. So easy to remember your mind set the three and the three. What are these three and the three? Three types of cells. Then alveolar cells, then alveolar cells, they have macrophage and they have RBCs. So these are the three types of cells which form hyaline membrane. The others are proteins, which are proteinaceous exudate, proteinaceous exudate which comes out from dead alveolar cells. There is plasma protein, plasma protein, and fibrin. So these are the components of the hyaline membrane. These are the components of the hyaline membrane, and that's why we call it hyaline membrane disease. So uh, some people prefer uh, this term, hyaline membrane disease, so it avoids the confusion between RDS and ARDS. Yeah, and other forms of respiratory distress, because respiratory distress is not always RDS. So if you have respiratory distress, due to meconium respiration, due to pneumonia, yeah. So that's why uh, some people prefer the term hyaline membrane disease rather than RDS. <clears throat> Let's go to the stages of this hyaline membrane. Stages. Yeah. So, first 24 hours, first 24 hours, there is formation. Formation of this membrane. From 24 to 48 hours, macrophage will ingest. The macrophage will start ingesting this membrane. At more than 48 hours, regeneration will start. Regeneration will start. Regeneration will start. The thing that this process is batchy. Patchy is not homogeneous. It is not homogeneous. This is another thing. This is another problem. Yeah, in the pathology in the lungs. It is not homogeneous. It is patchy. Like some alveoli, okay, distended, some alveoli not distended. So that's why when you inflate, you may give good pressure for certain alveoli, but it is high for other alveoli, and then you go to one problem. So the changes are patchy. So more than seven days. No more hyaline membrane. No more hyaline membrane. Hyaline membrane should be regenerated and intact. If after more than seven days you find fibrosis and thickening, means the patient is going to bronchopulmonary dyspnea. Bronchopulmonary dyspnea or chronic lung disease of the newborn. Chronic lung disease of the newborn. <clears throat> so these are the basic pathophysiological uh, things which we need to know about RDS. Remember that patients with RDS, patients with RDS, they will have high pulmonary artery pressure. High pulmonary artery pressure. So the pulmonary artery pressure is high in RDS. So they may go to PBHM. Yeah. So all the pulmonary artery pressure is high, whether it reaches the level of PBHM or not, but pulmonary artery pressure is high. And that's why when you go and read the factors at, uh, attributing to PBHM, you'll find RDS 
one of them. So they have shunt, shunt through foramen ovale, and they have shunt through ductus arterius. Okay, let's go to that ventilator strategy. Ventilator strategy in RDS. So, number one, supplemental oxygen. Supplemental oxygen. Supplemental oxygen and heated, humidified, hard. Low nasal cannula, H H H F M C. Heated, humidified, high flow nasal cannula. So these are the first five. If the RDS is not severe, if the RDS is not severe, we can use supplemental oxygen and heated, humidified, high flow nasal cannula. After that, CPAP. CPAP is very important. CPAP is very good. In RDS. That's why now you see in NRB, CBAB is not to wait until you send the patient to an ICU. CBAB can start in the delivery room. CBAB can start in the delivery room. Don't wait until you send the patient to an ICU. They found that CBAB is very good and a lot of studies done which give, give good outcome. What CBAB will improve? So, I will make it easy for you. Sibab, when you remember Sibab, remember for we is pneumonia. For we, Sletko. For we, Sletko. I will tell you what is for we, what is Sletko. So, if this one was answered by Dr. Shabinaz last time, so CBAB will improve functional residual capacity. This is the most important mechanism of action for CBAB. It improves functional residual capacity. It improves recruitment of alveolar. Recruitment. Recruitment of alveoli. Recruited means keep the alveoli open. Positive pressure, keep the alveoli open. So when you say recruitment, means you keep the alveoli open. When you keep the alveoli open, you have high constant oxygen. So this will improve oxygenation. Oxygenation. It will improve oxygenation. Improve oxygenation. It will decrease wear of breathing. Wear of breathing and it will decrease intra-thoracic pressure intra-thoracic pressure it will increase yeah it will increase it will increase not decrease increase intra-thoracic pressure and this one Dr. Farhana answered last time when I asked the question. So the benefit, when we increase intrathoracic pressure, we decrease venous return, we decrease the preload. So this will improve the heart failure. We have heart failure. But we shouldn't use it very high. Otherwise, the patient will go into high boom perfusion. So let's go to SLATCO. SLATCO, S is for surfactant pool. Surfactant. Bull, P O L. Yeah, can you think why C bad increase surfactant bull? You see, now when I started talking about the basic, I said all premature babies born they have some surfactant because surfactant is produced by type 2 pneumocytes from 22 weeks. So all the babies we see, we see after 22 weeks. So all of them have some surfactant. 
But the problem when they come out, because the anterior cells are damaged, so there is leak of the protein, there is inhibition of the surfactant function. Then they will go to hypoxia and acidosis, and after that, this will inhibit surfactant function more, and inhibit surfactant synthesis. When you use CBAP and you keep the alveoli open, so you are reducing hypoxia and acidosis. So when you are reducing hypoxia, means you are reducing the inhibition to the surfactant. You are reducing the inhibition. So that's why increasing surfactant goal. L4, lung injury. Decreasing lung injury. And remember in the beginning of the lecture, when I said lung injury, lung gets more injured when you get intermittent pressure. When I did in the balloon. Intermittent pressure. When you keep continuous pressure, that is this injury. So that's why CBAP is good in decreasing lung injury. <clears throat> A improves or we can say reduce. Reduce alveolar arterial gradient. Alveolar arterial gradient. Means that PaO2 in the alveoli and in the arterial. When we have good CBAP, so we reduce the gradient, means no much shift. No much shift. Remember uh, in this session, when I mentioned about physiological shunt, BAO2, we reached the alveoli as 104. After that, we find it in the arteries as 100. That is because of physiological shunt, which is the two TBC and veins and bronchial veins. If we have problem in the alveoli, the shunt will be worse. Shunt will be worse. The gradient will be worse. So when you're using CBAP for doing dilatation of the alveoli, so this gradient will be less. Gradient will be less. T is tidal volume. Tidal volume. Tidal volume. So surfactant improves tidal volume. I will tell you why it improves tidal volume. Yeah, I will tell you why. C is a cross sectional area. Cross sectional area. Sectional area in the upper airway. Increase cross sectional area in the upper airway. And remember when I mentioned about that, physiology of small babies, they have narrow airways. They have high resistance. So this CBAP increases the cross-sectional area. They improve. So cross-sectional area from up here until down. And you have the example in our world. You have a voice. Yeah, you have a voice. So a voice, his problem is in the upper airway. He has laryngomalacia. And all of you notice it. Why he improves with CBAP? So simply, a voice improves with CBAP because there is an increase of cross-sectional area. Increase of cross sectional area so that the regomalacia will not cause much obstruction anymore with increasing cross sectional area. O is decreasing obstructive apnea. Obstructive, obstructive apnea. Decreasing obstructive apnea. So I remember last time I was, was always wondering how come CBAP is used for apnea. And how come babies, when they are connected to CBAP, don't have more apnea? I was thinking, wondering, because I know CBAP, there is no pressure, no breathing we are giving to the patient. The patient breathes by himself. We are giving only pressure. But how come patient becomes no, not happening anymore? And that's the reason, the reason is that obstructive. Because if you go to apnea and the neonatus, they have central apnea and obstructive apnea. Obstructive apnea is due to obstruction of the respiratory. So when you use CBAP, you increase the cross-sectional area in the upper airways and lower airways, so there is no more obstruction and no more apnea. <clears throat> and goal is an goal 
it had found this one in 2000 and 1999 1999 found increased compliance increased compliance and decreased resistance with CPEP. He found increased compliance and decreased resistance with CPEP. Who can explain? Can I give you a question now that you think why CPEP increased compliance? If you look here to these parameters, you can explain. You can explain why surfactant increases the compliance. Can I get the answer from one of the most? Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, why CBAP increases the compliance? Yeah. If you look here, you will know the answer. So CBAP increases surfactant pool. Like we mentioned it, it dilates the airways to reduce hypoxia, so increase surfactant pool. So when you have more surfactant, you have less elastance, so you have better compliance. Yeah, this is the explanation why CBAP increases the compliance. Why CBAP decreases resistance? You must know also, because like we said, it decreases the cross-sectional area. So when increase cross-sectional area, increase diameter. And what is the equation of resistance? Resistance equal A eta L over by R to the power four. By R to the power four. So it is inverse relation, inverse relation. When this diameter increase, the resistance will be less. It is inverse relation. And that's why tidal volume improves. That's why tidal volume improves. Tidal volume improves when you see that because it will improve compliance. When you have better compliance, you have better tidal volume. So we finished supplemental oxygen and heated the humidified high flow as a carrier. See that the third one is ensure technique. Ensure. Ensure technique. Ensure. What is ensure technique? Ensure N for intubation. SUR for surfactant and E for extubation e for extubation so this one is done even in the labor room even in the labor room so you intubate the patient you give surfactant or relaxed surfactant and then you can extubate the patient so they found this ensure technique they found a decrease bronchopulmonary dysplasia it decrease bronchopulmonary dysplasia they found that a decrease need for mechanical ventilation. A decrease need for mechanical ventilation. But they found it increase surfactant use. Increase use of surfactant. When you use ensure, means you will increase use of surfactant. So last time, uh, in UM, uh, our policy for management of units, we don't use ensure technique. Yeah, we don't use ensure technique. We don't give surfactant as prophylactic. 
we use CBAB, yes. And after that, we see because that last time in UM surfactant was expensive, more than 1,000, and patients have to pay. But definitely, if the patient needs this, he, he will get it. The patient, he or she, will get it. Otherwise, uh, there will be counseling for the variants, whether they can afford the price of surfactant or not. So number four is the invasive ventilation. Invasive ventilation. Sorry, do this, my Yes. For the insure, the third one, is there any specific gestational age that is recommended recommended for this one? Uh, there is no definite gestational age. I didn't see uh, in the references which I saw. I didn't see any certain gestational age. Unless Dr. Sayyid Abdul Khan knows something, he wants to tell us. Can I refer the question to you, Dr. Sayyid Abdul Khan? Nothing to add. Insure is just technique. Insure is just a technique of how you give, uh, how you give surfactant. Uh, uh, in UK now they are using Lisa as well, but I think it's just technique. There's no, there's no clear kind of point uh, in terms of each. Okay. <clears throat> so let's go to the invasive ventilation. Invasive ventilation. Uh, sorry, Dr. Ismail. Yes. Uh, just another question regarding the surfactant usage. Is there mm -hmm. any um, role of us giving it, um, what do you call this, uh, prophylactically? Yeah, this one, in fact, uh, ensure. Ensure, in, ensure the technique is uh, about prophylactic surfactant. Yeah, that's why they, they extubate the patient. They extubate no. the patient. They, they give okay. the surfactant and they extubate. What I mean is, uh, when you're doing that insure, uh, you don't have to take any ABG first, or you, I mean, you don't have to calculate the A ratio. You just give the insure and then extubate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. it, it, it is to give immediate. It is prophylactic. It is prophylactic surfactant. Insure, insure is not only therapeutic, uh, it's not only prophylactic, it can be used for both prophylactic and therapeutic as well. So the idea behind, behind insure is that it reduces uh, uh, invasive ventilation, the need for you to intubate. So that is the reason why we do insure. So you can do it prophylactically or you can do it therapeutically. So in patients with, uh, at birth, we, you see signs of uh, uh, RDS, signs of respiratory distress at birth. Any distress at birth, then you can give insure. So you intubate, you give surfactant, and then you extubate at delivery site. So uh, this is insure. But you can also do other things such as LISA. Also, these are all just procedures how you give surfactant. But uh, I think we can either use a prophylaxis, and we can also use as therapeutic. I think there are several studies suggesting uh, usage, uh, 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 suggestion, uh, benefits of giving prophylactic surfactant. Uh, I think most most studies suggest we can give prophylactic surfactant, but I think we, we need to see several factors such as uh, age, uh, risk factors, and and and, uh, and others. Also, mainly is the 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 guideline, the local guidelines as well. Okay. Uh, okay. One more question, <laughs> just regarding the uh, insure. Um, is there any like weight or any uh, age group limit? Sorry, just now the voice was not clear. Uh, can you repeat the question? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, is there any um, weight limit or any age limit that we then don't give the insure? Okay, I, I refer the question to uh, Dr. Sayyid Abdul Khala. As far as I know, 
I didn't encounter any yet. I we need to go. I, I personally, I need to go back to the to the literatures. But again, these are all uh, techniques of 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 uh, giving giving surfactant to 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 uh, reduce need for back, uh, uh, invasive ventilation. Uh, so uh, I I can't uh, remember the number now. Actually. That's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we proceed. So now we go to that invasive ventilation. Invasive ventilation. So first should we take pressure control or volume control or P R V C? Yeah, they ask you which one you will choose. Okay, Dr. Fetri, I ask you which one you like to use, P C or V C or P R V C? I prefer uh, volume control. You prefer volume control. Okay. Why you prefer volume control? Because um, the volume uh, is already pre-calculated rather than the pressure. It can be determined by uh, obstruction mm -hmm. or kinking of the tubes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, everyone has advantage and disadvantage. Uh, so when you give pressure control, the good thing that you can control the pressure, so you don't have barotrauma. You can secure pressure, you don't have barotrauma, but you cannot guarantee the tidal volume. You cannot guarantee the tidal volume, especially in small babies, <clears throat> because they're, they're mechanics, like we mentioned, they have a high elastance of the lung, so difficult to generate tidal volume for them. For the volume control, it is good, like you mentioned, Dr. Petri, you can guarantee the tidal volume, but there is risk of barotrauma. Because if the ventilator cannot achieve the target tidal volume, the ventilator will give higher pressure. Will give higher pressure, continue to give higher pressure until the patient may go into barotrauma, especially, like I mentioned, it, the disease is heterogeneous distribution. So, there may be some alveoli not distended, not achieving tidal volume, but on the other side, there are some alveoli over distended. And the ventilator keeps increasing the pressure to achieve that tidal volume until the patient goes into barotrauma. So theoretically, we feel PRVC is the safest. PRVC is the safest. PRVC, you ask for your target tidal volume, but you have pressure limit. You have pressure limit. So if you are not achieving the tidal volume and the ventilator needs to increase the pressure, if the ventilator reaches the limit, you will have the alarm. So theoretically, PRPC is the best. But on study, they found no difference on long term. No difference on long term. So you can put your protocol as you like volume control or pressure control or BRBC. Once you provide the adequate care, there is no difference on long term. <clears throat> Let's go to the mood. Which mood should we use? Okay, uh, anyone wants to tell me which mood should we use? SIMD, ACPC, mm -hmm. SV, PTV. Okay, so it is prepared to see the RR, see the RR of the patient, see the RR. If the RR is more than 60, if the RR is more than 60, it is recommended to use assisted control. Assisted control. If RR less than 60, it is recommended to use SIMV 
with the pressure of some water. Don't use SIV alone. Don't use SIV alone. Don't use SIV alone. If you use SIV, you need to use it with pressure support. So the goal of this strategy that the patient is very tachypnic, very distressed, so we need to support every breathing. Like, you know, assistive control will support every breathing. Every breathing for the patient will be supported. So we'll make the patient comfortable and decrease the weight of the breathing of the patient. If the patient has this than 16, you support with this IMV with certain rate, and the other breaths which don't come on time get support by only pressure. Support by only pressure. SIMV alone is not good. SIMV alone is not good. You remember when we discussed the modus SIMV, for example, if you have rate of 20 per minute, for example, you have 20 per minute. So your SIMV will give breathe here, like we have zero here, zero second. <clears throat> so 20 per minute means one breathe, one breathe every three seconds. This is only example. So zero, one, two, three. So your SIV will give the breathing here, will give the breathing here, and will give the breathing here. If the patient breathe, for example, here at four seconds, he will not get support with this IMV alone. So that's why the work of breathing may be not help. The work of breathing, because babies, they breathe, they are the kidney, yeah, they breathe, so in between, they don't get enough support. Yeah, so it is not good to use this IMV alone. You use this IMV with pressure support. So in this IMV with the pressure support, if they breathe here, they get support for the breathing. But only pressure. They get support by only pressure. If assisted control, so don't worry. Assisted control support everywhere. And full support, like we mentioned in the previous classes. Full support. It will give the TI. It will give the adequate pressure. Yeah, makes the patient very comfortable. That's why, because it makes the patient very comfortable, we use it if the patient has RR more than 60. So now, which strategy you will use? In this case, RDS. Will you use the restrictive strategy or we use the obstructive strategy regarding the parameters? Anyone answer? Do you think lung protective strategy is good for RDS? Yes, you can use lung protective strategy. Lung protective strategy. So use good beep. Yeah. Use good beep. When you use lung protective strategy with good beep, does not mean that you have to go to high beep. Like I said, nine to 12. Depend on the response, on the oxygenation. If your patient, if your patient improves with lower beam, let's say five or six, that's fine. But you have the chance to titrate. If your patient is not responding, you have the chance to titrate. To titrate by increasing beam. So that's the meaning of lung protective strategy. If your patient is responding fine with that beam, so keep it like this. Tighter volume. In RDS, you give just four to five, four to five emit per kg. And you need to pay attention to that synchrony. Be sure the patient is synchronized. Synchrony with the ventilator. Synchrony is very important. 
synchrony is very important. The patient is not synchronized, he will not be comfortable. Synchrony is uh, a big uh, subject. Uh, if you are interested, we can arrange another time to talk about patient ventilator asynchrony. We have trigger asynchrony, asynchrony. We have uh, cycling asynchrony. So uh, everyone has uh, certain features and certain adjustments. Basically, if the patient is not synchronized, what will happen? You will see the patient not comfortable with the ventilator. You will see the patient tachypneic. You see the patient having tachycardia. Patient may have diaphoresis. So that is the patient who is not synchronized with the ventilator. If the patient is synchronized with the ventilator, he will appear comfortable. So they made something called NAVA. NAVA. NAVA, they found it very useful. NAVA is neurally adjusted ventilator assist. Neurally adjusted ventilator assist. Neurally adjusted ventilator assist. This one helped the signal. It is not available here in Malaysia. It is not available. So NAVA is you insert catheter in the esophagus. Catheter in the esophagus. Catheter in esophagus. So this uh, catheter will detect the electrical activity of diaphragm will detect electrical electrical activity of diaphragm. It's like an EMG, but looking at the diaphragmatic muscles. Is it? Mm -hmm. It's like an EMG and like ECG, but looks at the electrical activity of the diaphragms. Yes, electrical activity. So that uh, the signal when the when the, the catheter detects the electrical activity, it will send the signal to the ventilator. So the ventilator will provide the breathing. So the breathing comes at the appropriate time. Any other thing, uh, Dr. Sayyid Khalaq, you want to add about that? Uh, it's okay. It's all right. Yeah. They can use. They can even use the uh, uh, probes that they put on the uh, on the skin. Now I think I saw on my uh, I saw my colleague doing the study. They put they put the probes on the skin. They are, they are trying. I, I think it's still under study in UK. I see. <clears throat> so after that. If your patient is not responding, you will go to HFOV. Indication is of HFOV. Indication is, indication is of HFOV. So to go to HFOV, so HFOV is not the first choice in RDS. HFOV is not the first choice. The first choice is that conventional ventilation. Conventional ventilation, like I said, breathing is more than 60 per minute. We go for assistive control. If it's than 60, we go to SIV with the pressure support. And before I go to, uh, to HFOV, I forgot to tell something. Regarding the wheeling, if your patient is improving, if the patient is improving on conventional ventilation, you start decreasing the rate. You start decreasing the rate, the rate of this IMV. Because the winning mode is that is IMV. So it's IMV with pressure support. Until at the end, the patient will stay on very few breaths, and at the end, you may keep only on pressure support only. You may keep the patient on pressure support. But be careful here when you keep the patient on pressure support. Don't forget apnea ventilation. Apnea ventilation, it must be on. So this is really important. We shouldn't forget. Yeah. We shouldn't forget. Otherwise, you cut down the rate, you keep the pressure support, and the patient goes to apnea. Yeah, and he will suffer from this apnea. 
because if your apnea ventilation is off, it will not work. So be sure your apnea ventilation is on. <clears throat> So, indications of pitch FOB. Indications of H FOB. So, H FOB, like I said, is not the first choice. Indicated H FOB if your patient already, already received surfactant. Already received surfactant twice. Because we know we can add another dose of surfactant after 12 hours. If your patient already received surfactant, your patient needs high peak inspiratory pressure. High peak inspiratory pressure more than 30. Your patient needs high peak inspiratory pressure more than 30. If your patient needs high FIO2, there's a set need for high FIO2 more than 0.6. So in this case, you go to HFOV. HFOV. And again, be sure you need to open your lung. Open your lung before you go to HFOV. Because HFOV, rather than open, it keeps open. It keeps the lung open. <clears throat> So you may need high MAB when you go to HFOB, you may need high MAB. You may need high MAB. Yeah. You may reach even 25. You may need 25 centimeter water to improve that oxygenation. To improve that oxygenation. Like we mentioned in the better surgery. So this MAB is continuous, continuous, continuous. 25, exposing more concentrated oxygen to the alveolar membrane. So it improves oxygenation, but don't keep it high too. High. Once your patient improves, you come down to keep it between 16 to 20. Keep your MAB between 16 to 20, and after that, you can continue on the weaning of HFOB. Another option. Uh, why why HFOB uh, is not the first choice? Yeah, they found that if you go to HFOB as first choice, HFOB as first choice, they found that it decreases PBD. So that's good. But unfortunately, they found that it increases IBH. And you know IBH is very dangerous. Yeah, grade three or grade four. So in fact, it is worse, worse than BBD because we know BBD. If they grow well, they will come out. They will come out of chronic lung disease. But IVH, if they develop hydrocephalus and brain damage, they will suffer all life. So that's why HFOB is not the first choice. Another option is HFJV. HFJV. High frequency jet ventilation. This one I didn't uh, give big, big details about it before. If you are interested, we can arrange uh, another class. Uh, Dr. Said Abdul Khalid mentioned about it in the last time. So, the difference between HFJV and HFOV HFOV is active inspiration and active expiration. HFJV, active inspiration and passive expiration. It is another mode. J for jet. This one uses in tandem. Use it in tandem with the conventional ventilation. Means you are using the conventional ventilation already, but on top of it, you are using the jet ventilation from the upper airway. If you are interested, we can discuss another another time. So this is JV. They did the trial that to go to it initially. Also, again, they found. Bronchopulmonary dysplasia is this. But unfortunately, also they found increased IVH. 
degrees IPH. So the trial stopped. They stopped the trial. They didn't continue. They didn't continue the trial because they noticed that IPH is dramatically increasing. <clears throat> So if our patient is not responding with conventional ventilation, not responding with HFOV, so what can we do for the patient? We can consider BBHN. You consider BBHN. Because we know RDS can lead to BBHN, so you consider INO. INO will help if you have BBHN. If the patient is not improving, we have to go to ECMO. Extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. But ECMO, which is not available here, it is available in IgN. ECMO, the problem you need, may be more than two kilogram, more than two kilogram, and you need maybe more than 34 weeks. Why they need this size? Because of that catheter, catheter size. They cannot find appropriate catheter size for baby less than two kilograms. Catheter size, and also because of anticoagulation. Catheter size and because of anticoagulation. So they found very good outcome. Very good outcome. Take move, survival advantage. Survival advantage, 80%. But unfortunately, if you take this criteria, you will exclude most of the cases of severe RDS. Because we know severe RDS, as the baby is smaller, less gestational age, less weight, you will have more severe RDS. Will you tell me more than two kilograms and more than 34 weeks? So in fact, you are taking minority of the patients. You are leaving the majority. Majority of severe RDS, you are not taking them because they are less than two kilogram and less than 34 weeks. Another thing I never seen in my life and I never heard about it, until recently, it is called pulmonary liquid ventilation, PLV, pulmonary, pulmonary liquid ventilation. This one not approved yet, still not approved, not approved. They found one liquid. Pulmonary liquid ventilation. One liquid called bare fluorocarbon. Bare fluorocarbon. Bare fluorocarbon, this is liquid, and they found it helped in the gas exchange. It is liquid which help in gas exchange. So it is just something theoretical. It is not approved yet. So it is only something theoretical. So let's go to the extubation. So you follow that criteria, which we mentioned generally. We we'll mentioned how to excavate the patient. We we'll look for the etiology. Uh, etiology is subsided, no fever, IO2 is not high. All the things, neurological status, gag reflex, work of breathing is not excessive, ABG is accepted, airway is protected. All these things in the excavation criteria. So go and review the previous classes. The most important, they compare, they compare the excavation on head box, oxygen, or extubation to CBAB. They found CBAB is better. Extubation to CBAB has better outcome than extubation on 
hit box. And then on CPAP, while you stop suddenly, or one shot stop, one shot, one shot, or cycling, like you give CPAP, then off, cycling. They found no difference. No difference. No difference. So you can stop one shot. No need for cycling. So I hope that's clear for RDS. Any questions or any feedback? Any comment about ventilator strategy for RDS? Dr. Say, Abdul Khalaf, do you have any comment? Anything you want to add? Okay, so if nothing to add, no questions, let's go to the second condition, which is Meconium aspiration. Meconium aspiration. Meconium aspiration syndrome. Meconium aspiration syndrome, MPS. Okay. First, what are the components of meconium? Components of meconium. Components. Components of meconium. So it is easy to remember the numeric El Mabu. El Mabu. These are the contents of meconium. I for intestinal epithelial cells. Intestinal epithelial. Cells. L4, Lanuku. M4, Mucus. A4, Amenutic Fluid. B4, Bile. And W4, Water. So these are the components of meconium. And we must know that meconium is very irritant. Meconium is very irritant. <clears throat> so let's go to the bad physiology of meconium aspiration. And here, the ventilator strategy will be more complex than RDS because RDS more clear pathology and more single pathway. Here we'll see in meconium aspiration, we have different pathways and the strategy may be conflicted. So let's say we have intrauterine, intra uterine stress. So this intrauterine stress intrauterine stress will lead to increased cortisol. Increased cortisol will lead to increased catecholamines. So normally when we have increased catecholamines, we have reduced bowel movement. This is the response. This is the physiological response in our body. When we have increased catecholamines, we have decreased bowel movement as response to the sympathetic system. In the fetus, the response is different. When you have increased catecholamines, you have increased bowel. You have increased bowel movement. This increased bowel movement will lead to passage of mucosa. Passage. Of 
میکنیم بحثش رو میکنیم ولی تو اسپایریشن اف میکنیم اسپایریشن اسپایریشن اف میکنیم When you have aspiration of meconium, you will have asphyxia. You will have asphyxia. When you have asphyxia, you will end with BBHN. BBHN. So, let's say what else will happen. If this aspiration, if we have proximal airway, proximal airway obstruction, what will happen? It will be like obstructive disease. They will have air throbbing, air throbbing. When we have air trapping, we have compression. Compression on pulmonary capillaries. When we have compression pulmonary capillaries, what will happen? What we call that? If the pulmonary capillaries are compressed, Anyone will tell what will happen with the pulmonary capillaries are compressed. Is it shunt or the space? Anyone can tell? Dead space. Dead ah. space. Very good. So it is dead space. So with compression pulmonary capillaries, it is dead space. So when we have the space, we will have hypoxia hypoxia and acidosis when you have hypoxia and acidosis they will lead to bbhl let's say the obstruction happened in the peripheral airways peripheral airways peripheral airways So, with the effect on the peripheral airways, what will happen? <clears throat> so, the denaturing of the surfactant. So, it will affect the peripheral airways. So, there will be decreased surfactant. <laughs> the meconium will occupy the place of the surfactant. So this will lead to decreased compliance and increased elastance. So decreased compliance and decreased elastance. Decreased elastance and decreased compliance. So the alveoli will not distend well. So this will be shunt. So you see. Just now here we have the space, now we have shunt. When we have shunt, also we have hypoxia and acidosis. When we have hypoxia and acidosis, we will have BBHM. So if we look here, we have here air throbbing. We have here air throbbing, and we have here decreased compliance. So in fact, we have we have the two pictures. We have the two pictures. We have the pictures of obstructive disease causing air throbbing here, and we have the decreased compliance. So it may come like this way. It may come in this way, and it may come both together, both together. So that's why meconium aspiration is not easy. It's not easy. You may have this one, 
you go in one central tissue. You have air traffic, increase the resistance, or you have decreased compliance, then you go to another strategy, or you may have both of them. Then you have to balance when you have both of them. Now I want uh, Dr. Sayyid Abdul Khalaq to show me the two extremes. The two extremes which I said. Can we see them, please, Dr. Sayyid Abdul Khalaq? Yeah. yeah. I want the employees to tell me which one has air traffic. And which one has decreased compliance? Wait, give me one second. First one. Okay, Mos. So what do you think? Do you think this is air traffic or decreased compliance? Decreased compliance. Decreased compliance. Very good. We can see that atelectasis. The lung is atelectatic. Yeah. Okay. We go to the next one. So this one, you can see the air traffic here. It is completely different. So you see both of them compare the, we can see the arrows. The arrows here point to the ex, expanded lung. We can see the lung is expanded even between the ribs, even between the ribs. If you count the ribs in the first X-ray, they are only eight. In this X-ray, they are nine. They are thin. In this extent, they are thin. So, you see, big difference. The rib size, the cardiac shadow also, if you look at the cardiac shadow, how is it in the first X-ray, and how is it in the second X-ray? If you look at the diaphragm also, in the first X-ray and second X-ray, you will notice the diaphragm is going down in the second X-ray. So, despite both are meconium aspiration, both of them are meconium aspiration, but we need to use different strategies for the two patients. Is mine. Yes. Should we say another 15 minutes? How many minutes? 15. 15. 15. Okay. Okay. So I'll try to go faster. So, like we saw in the X ray now, we have either restrictive or obstructive. If I come to the causes of hypoxemia, causes of hypoxemia and Meconium aspiration and meconium aspiration. So we have shunt, like we saw now in the, the, in the diagram. We have the, the space and we have also BBH10. So that's why we need to know which one is causing the hypoxemia, which one is more predominant to know how to manage the patient. So ventilator strategy and we call it aspiration. Number one, supplemental oxygen, supplemental. Oxygen. In my cases, let's say if it is light meconium, yeah, light meconium, no severe distress, you can give supplemental oxygen. You can give supplemental oxygen. Be sure your FiO2 does not exceed 0 0.8. If your FiO2 more than 0 0.8, your supplemental oxygen is not enough. Don't continue. You are wasting the time. You are doing the thing which is not in favor of that patient. So you proceed higher. With higher supplement, you go to CPAP. CPAP. So that's why, see here now, because if I have a restrictive problem, I need high beam, high CPAP. I have restrictive problem. If I have a restrictive problem, I need low 
beef cigarette. So what to do? They recommended medium cigarette. Medium beef. Medium beef. Medium means between five to eight. Five to eight. But usually, unfortunately, patients with meconium, they found that usually not tolerated. Usually not tolerated. If we think why is that not tolerated, despite it is tolerated in other conditions, why in meconium it is not tolerated? Because CBAB, CBAB may make the child is agitated, agitated. And this agitation will increase pulmonary vascular resistance. Increase pulmonary vascular resistance. So it will worsen BBH. It will worsen BBH. It will worsen. So CBAB decide it is good that you try CBAB, but most of the case it is not tolerated. Once your patient is not stable with oxygen, it needs, he needs ventilation. He needs invasive ventilation. Remember, while you are managing your patient with meconium, ensure a neutral thermal environment. Neutral thermal environment, NTE. Be sure you have the good temperature. Because if the surrounding temperature is not appropriate, you need more consumption of oxygen. And we know meconium can lead to bad hypoxia. The other thing is minimal handling. Minimal handling. Don't handle the patient a lot. Minimal handling. Why? Because handling will make the patient cry, agitate. And this agitation will increase pulmonary vascular resistance. And it will worsen PBHM. And I remember, I saw that. I saw that in UM last time, in the United unit, many babies. That's why the nurses uh, described these babies, touch me, no. Touch me, no. Baby is stable. You come to do your round, you want to assist, you touch the baby. You want to see the perfusion to touch the hands. Patient is saturated. You go away, stop, don't touch the patient. Saturation becomes fine. So I saw, I saw this thing practically. The other thing here, UEC is very important. Carry on, do your UEC. Because you need frequent, you need frequent sampling. And again, if you want to do your frequent sampling by CBG, you will break the baby, then the baby will be agitated. You will increase pulmonary vascular resistance. You will worsen that BBHK. Mm -hmm. So, to manage, I need, I need. Can I add, can I add one more point about CPAP use in meconium? <coughs> yes, yes, sure, sure. Because the, uh, the, the, the first thing is, I'm not a fan of using CPAP in term babies. I, 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 I'm not in favor of using CPAP in term babies. That's one thing. The other thing is, uh, meconium, they, they have a risk of causing ball valve effect. So, with, especially with ball, ball valve effect, it can cause, there's higher risk of uh, uh, air leak, like pneumothorax and things. Okay. okay, thanks, thanks. <clears throat> so, we go for intubation. Intubation in case of meconium despite we know that uh, most of the intubation procedures in the neonate, they are used without sedation, not like in pediatric intensive care, when you use a pre-medication in units, you see most of the time the intubation is done without pre-medication. The situation is different in meconium. In meconium, you need pre-medication. You need pre-medication. And the reason, like I said, because if you don't give pre-medication, if you don't give pre-medication, the patient will be agitated. When the patient is agitated, you will increase pulmonary vascular resistance. Then you will worse, worsen BBHN. So it is recommended to give pre-medication unless it is emergency intubation. Unless it is emergency. If it is emergency intubation, it's okay. Otherwise, 
it is recommended to give free medication and keep the patient on sedation. Again, also, if you notice that, a lot of debate about sedation and most of the time, neonates in the in, uh, in ICU do not receive sedation. But in Mikori, the situation is different. Because when they are agitated, like I said, they will have high pulmonary vascular resistance, then this will worsen BBH. So sedation is recommended. Sedation is recommended in patients with meconium. After that, I must look at the chest X-ray. Like now we see, we saw the X-ray. So we are at two different strategies. Despite the same disease, meconium aspiration, but the X-ray tell me to go by different strategy for both of them, for each of them. And very important, eco. It's very important to use eco. Don't delay. Here, we need to do eco because we know PBHN risk is high. Meconium is a common cause of PBHN. So before I decide which strategy, I must do my chest X-ray and I must do my eco. So now I can go how to go, how to proceed. I look at my X-ray, I look at my eco. So BBHN, there's BBHN, there's no BBHN. Uh, this one is obstructive, this one is restrictive. So I know how to proceed with the strategy. So let's go see how to proceed with the strategy. How many minutes now? Five, ten minutes, five, ten minutes. Ten minutes. Five, ten minutes. <laughs> so maybe we can stop now. We can stop and next class, we start with the strategy. You can go and read and think what strategy we use for the latest X-ray and what strategy we do for the second X-ray. And if it is mixed, because it may be mixed, some parts, obstruction in the proximal and air traveling the other bar is at Yeah, so you can go and read there and then we discuss in the next class. Meanwhile, any questions at the moment and any comments? Ismail, yeah. uh, I have a question. Okay, so mm -hmm. this, this is a question from uh, my mentees from my mentee mm -hmm. in uh, year five. Eh? They, they viewed your videos before. This is uh, uh, not according to uh, this current session. They viewed your videos before. They have two questions. Mm -hmm. You can answer and then I'll share to them. So, okay. uh, so this is brother uh, Aklan. So he asked, uh, uh, you compared uh, uh, between that space and something. And you mentioned mm -hmm. that uh, to differentiate between these two, we need to measure PACO2 and ETCO2 gradient. So exactly, that, yes. So in that space, PACO2, PACO2 will be high, while ETCO2 will be low, leading to higher gradient as compared to... Uh, in yes, yes, correct, gradient. correct. So the question is, uh, why the gradient in shunting will be normal? Uh, because he thought, he thought, uh, in, in the event of shunting, VQ mismatch will lead to no oxygen exchange. So that is first question. So why 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 is the pre, uh, the gradient uh, uh, different? So okay, the, okay. The second, I, I so his second question is, you mentioned about differences of VQ ratio in all three zones of the lungs. Yes. So, so his question is, uh, do we aim to prevent from high or low VQ mismatch in practice of uh, change uh, altering the position, and how frequent uh, how frequent do we do uh, uh, alteration of position? So that is his question. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. So I asked the first question. So there is the question. So we have shunt here, and we have the space here. Okay. So.
So if I have oxygen coming here, and here no oxygen, no oxygen, so exit no carbon dioxide, no carbon dioxide. So no oxygen coming, no carbon oxide, no, no oxygen is coming in, no carbon dioxide is coming out. Oxygen coming in here, carbon dioxide is coming out here. Yeah, what came here? Equivalent to it came out there. Equivalent to it came out there. If I go to the space, So I have oxygen coming here, oxygen coming here, and oxygen coming here. But I have the space here. I have the space. So this CO2 will not come out here. CO2 will come out. CO2 will come out, the second one. But this, not, this CO2, it will not come out. It cannot, it cannot come out. So the oxygen which came in, it will go back there. Oxygen came in and it go back because there was no exception. So that's why it is not equivalent. You can see here, it is equivalent. But here, it is not equivalent. We cannot see it. 2 CO2 for 2 oxygen. But here, 2 CO2 for 3 oxygen. So it is not equivalent. So that's why increase the gradient. Increase the gradient. So I hope it is clear for him. And uh, if it is still not clear, uh, you can ask him to contact me. Uh, I hope it is clear by this demonstration. Yep. Yes, clear. <clears throat> uh, next question. Uh, the other question. Okay. He asked about the, the, you mentioned about the VQ, difference in VQ in uh, different zones of the lung. So mm -hmm. he asked, uh, do we aim to prevent from when we alter the position uh, in ventilation, in, in, in position in the ventilated patient, Frequently to prevent VQ mismatch, so he said, uh, "Do we do do we uh, alter the position to prevent from high or low VQ mismatch?" And how yes, yes, exactly. Yes, we do like that. We do like that. Yeah, to uh, prevent VQ mismatch, we keep turning the position. We keep turning the position. We put the patient in uh, prone position. We put the patient right lateral, left lateral. This is the aim to prevent VQ mismatch. And this is very important strategy in ARDS, especially in ARDS. Why? Because ARDS is heterogeneous. Heterogeneous. So that's why in ARDS, because it's heterogeneous, we want to provide inflation to most of the areas. So we keep turning. So for example, from position, if we take one child in the supine position, let's say this is supine, and this is brown. So, supine position patient, this is the chest of the patient, and this is the heart. This is the heart. So, significant part, significant part of the lung will be under the heart. If we use prone position, so 
So less spark, less spark will be under the heart. So we enhance ventilation for that area, not wider area. So we do that. We do turning position, we do suctioning, we do physiotherapy, all that to improve the VQ mismatch. Okay. Okay, clear. Thanks. Any other questions from the MOS? No, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So you tell me when where, when do you uh, what next session? Or you decide later or we'll discuss in the group. We'll discuss in the group. Okay, okay. I am ready at any time and will come at any time. Okay. And thank you for attending. Okay, thank you all. Thank you, thank you very much.